Thanks, Valerie, for that great introduction. Um, welcome, good morning. It's nice to see you all. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be here. This is, uh, I couldn't ask for a more kind of ready audience to uh, hear what, uh, what I you know, am so interested in and passionate about to talk about every day. So thank you all for being here. Um, so uh, we are in the midst of a global transformation in the way we think about the purpose of education and how to prepare students for the future. And that is not a piece of fluff. That is an actual measurable thing. Okay, last week uh, in New York City, where I'm from, the UN General Assembly convened around the new uh, Sustainable Development Goals. This is a to-do list for the planet, right? Uh, and the last Millennium Development Goals uh, sunsetted this, you know, this past month, September 2015, after 15 years, an incredible milestone was reached. 60 million children around the world, 60 million additional children, were um, placed into education as a result, or, you know, as a result of efforts that gathered around the rubric of the Millennium Development Goals. 60 million children around the world. That was a very simple goal. It was a very simple metric. Kids in classrooms, butts in seats. The next set of goals for the UN, for, the, for, the, for countries around the planet, um, number four of these 17 goals is quality education. It contains things about basic literacy and numeracy. So it contains basic access to education. It contains vocational and technical education, preparing people for the future. It also has this crazy wild card, goal 4.7, all learners acquire knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, including uh, sustainable development, sustainable lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, a culture of peace and nonviolence, global citizenship, and appreciation of cultural diversity. This is the first time that w countries around the planet have agreed that there is a qualitative aspect to education, that it is supposed to be transformative for society, and that that is a goal that they're agreeing to set as, a national, as an international target is absolutely incredible. We don't know what the metrics are going to be for this target. And the people that I talk to who were involved in this process say, you know, it's really bold. There's been a lot of debate about it. And it was actually developing countries who stood up and said, you know what, we don't just need basic literacy and numeracy. We need to go far beyond that. We need to prepare our young people for a 21st century world. And we need to leapfrog what's been available in the past. So uh, the goals that have been set mean that there are new ways to think about those metrics. We have to just, if we, if we set a goal like this, you sure as hell better have a way to reach it, right? Um, I'm gonna give you a second lens in my 25 minutes here to talk about what it is that we need to be preparing our kids for. And that is about, not just about the globe, but about the future, right? It is a laugh line, but it is an uneasy laugh line. Because we know, Oxford University study a couple of years ago, 47% of jobs in danger of being automated in the next 15 odd years, certainly by the time our students are out in the workforce. Uh, if technology is changing, uh, very, very, you know, if you go into CVS and you see the automatic um, checkout stations or you go to LegalZoom and you can fill out your own uh, paperwork to get any legal work done, you know that many, many jobs are being automated. And so that begs the question, what are we preparing our students for? We're not going to be giving them skills that can be easily taken over by a computer. So how do we think about what technology does well and what people do well? I find this to be an incredibly valuable lens for thinking about what you guys call the four C's, what, what other people might call 21st century skills. Um, so what is it that computers don't do that well? This is a picture from my friends at Planet Money. It's a video, actually, of a robot folding a towel. Um, and this robot takes about a minute and a half to fold a simple hand towel. And if you give it a shirt, it's totally lost. And what is the issue with folding a towel? Well, a towel is an unpredictable three-dimensional object that's floppy and folding and twisting. You have to model it in real time. You have to understand where the corners are. It's a constantly changing, chaotic situation that you have to impose order on. And that is something that the algorithms and the software in a computer, uh, not to mention the mechanical interactions, they're just not very good at dealing with complexity and chaos. Um, so this kind of gets to this question of what is it that people do well, what is it that computers do well, and how do we collaborate as we move into the future? 
Um, you know, so, so the CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt, um, thinks of it as there is a separation of powers between humans and computers, and collaborating with computers while specializing in what we do best is what the most competitive people are going to be doing moving forward. Um, and so what are the four things that people still do better at computers? I look at it this way. Making a sandwich is this physical interaction with the unpredictable three-dimensional world, time, space, um, physical objects. Giving a hug is empathy. It is uh, motivational leadership. It is connecting with people on an emotional level, whether to provide support or inspiration or exhortation. Telling a story and solving a mystery. Telling a story is about, again, making sense out of complexity, imposing order on seemingly unconnected bits of data. Solving a mystery is about figuring out what questions to ask. So a computer can help you investigate almost any question you want to know about, but it takes a person to generate the questions. So what does this mean about what we need to be cultivating and pushing forward in our schools? I find that this very, very congruent with the global goals in the sense that we need to prepare our students to be more human, to be the best of what humans can be, to be creative, to be collaborative, to impose order on chaos, to tell stories, to decide what's relevant, and most of all, to generate their own questions. Um, so uh, what are we doing today? How are we measuring what we do and how are we conceiving of the goal of school? Um, we have this 18th century technology called the bell curve. And um, the bell curve is really, you know, it was an incredible discovery for the time, the idea that most human endeavors would fall along this normal distribution. It was really based on scarcity, if you think about it. What it was like to gather data or gather feedback or information in a paper and pencil or, or quill and paper world. The idea that you have a limited amount of time to assess what you're doing. You have a limited number of questions that you can ask. You have to simplify the relationship between questions and answers, artificially flatten them out into a four choice, multiple choice rubric. And this is all based on the idea that collecting and capturing data is onerous, it takes up a lot of time, it takes up a lot of space, a lot of attention, and therefore you need to artificially map whatever it is that you're doing onto an oversimplified rubric in order to project it into a bell curve result. Um, and this is a result that we have where we say, you know, in the 21st century, we had an increasing demand and exhortation for precision and for data and information about feedback, about outcomes of what we wanted to do. And we had this 19th century technology of standardized tests. So what we did, we piled tests upon tests upon tests. And many of you, I don't have to tell you what that means in your districts when the test requirements pile up on top of each other, but it's interesting to think about. It's fundamentally a scarcity model on a world that is uh, very, very different, right? Um, and we know that these tests don't map to the abilities that students most uh, need to be developing, and they don't map to what feedback and what assessment really is like in the real world. Um, this is a reference to a study that was conducted uh, where there were schools in the Boston area that were very, very successful at raising students' math scores and standardized tests, but when they gave them a different kind of test of fluid intelligence, basically puzzle solving, um, this sort of solving a mystery type of test, that they found that the apparent rise in math scores had not translated to a rise in math skills. Um, and so when these tests are so narrowly focused, when they're based on this scarcity model of just asking exactly this question with exactly this concept behind it, you're really not capturing the whole world of, uh, of what you're trying to teach in that subject. The whole subject gets flattened out. And this really goes to the question of, you know, when you impose a standardized bell curve rubric and you have a single marker for proficiency on it, um, inevitably what happens is that the attention goes to mastering a specific subset of skills for a specific subset of students. And you know the, the illustration in this uh, slide is referencing the idea that when the goal is proficiency, naturally you're going to triage your efforts and you're going to focus all of your attention on the students who are just below passing. And um, that is too bad for the students who are far down on the curve and it's also far, far too bad for the students who are far up on the curve. I've written a couple of pieces recently about what happens to gifted students in a proficiency focused world. Um, so uh, everybody knows this, this is conventional wisdom now, and um, I wasn't the first one to kind of tell the, the, the school leadership community about this, but I was the first one to kind of bring it to a broader audience and, and convene this conversation about, you know, we have these tests 
that don't match what we want students to know. We don't, they don't match how we want students to learn it because there is no congruence between the types of requirements you have to satisfy to get through school and what you want to be doing um, in the world of 10 to 15 years from now. Um, and so it's really important to observe the connection between the types of assessment systems and processes that we put into our schools, into our school systems, from the classroom level to the professional level to the district level, and even in our states and governments, the connection between how we assess and what we actually are doing, right? So Dylan William, um, an assessment expert in the UK, has observed this idea that Feedback is how we shape, we form mindset. By giving students feedback in a certain way, you know, if you have uh, feedback where the, the level of the test is either a one, two, three, or four, and year after year the students are one, two, threes, or fours, how do you cultivate growth mindset within that type of system? Um, it's very, very centered around the idea of a fixed mindset. So, you know, having kind of laid out this situation and the, and the mismatch or the misalignment between uh, 21st century skills, the global uh, agenda for edu transforming education and the types of assessments that we have now, I sat back and, and tried to kind of listen to the frontiers of what was happening as far as evolving uh, approaches to assessment that took in what we need to know, how we need to learn it, and how we know what we're doing. And that respected the fact that we're no longer in a world of scarcity when it comes to data collection, right? So um, I, for, for ease of uh, discovery and, and remembering, um, I, I put these into the four teams. And I talk about the four teams in the future of testing. Team Robot is a way of testing conventional subjects um, in uh, computer enhanced ways, digital ways. Team Monkey is a way of testing these unconventional 21st century skills about being the, the four C's, as you guys call them, um, in more conventional types of data collection ways. Team Butterfly is, uh, addresses itself to 21st century skills in holistic and creative ways. And Team Unicorn is the mythical future of having tests that are incredibly precise, incredibly um, specific and data rich, but also uh, are authentic and also are grounded in, in focusing on 21st century skills. Okay, so Team Robot, um, this idea that we're going to be able to gather lots and lots and lots of evidence on students, um, on student performance, and on what's happening in the classroom for teachers as well, uh, and that's sort of kind of run in the background, right? So, uh, you know, this is about logging students' interaction within a learning management system. Um, this is about uh, having a dashboard. This is about predictive analytics that raise up red flags when they see certain patterns happening, um, say your student didn't, you know, didn't even try to complete the homework last night, or you walk into class and you know that 60% of the classroom is um, struggling with a particular concept in math. I mean, we've all heard the sales pitches, um, and this is kind of the ultimate um, example of this, I think, it sort of represents where we might go with this, right? So, you know, these kinds of environments, there's kind of a fixed um, there are learning tasks and then there are right and wrong answers and then it's essentially um, multiple choice on steroids, right? It's invisible integrated electronic assessment. Um, the idea being that, you know, just as uh, businesses used to have to shut down and do inventory every, um, at the end of every year in the 1970s, manual inventory, now we have just-in-time inventory systems where every time the price guns uh, swipe something, there's a message that goes back to the warehouse and the um, order is automatically fulfilled. So there's never um, a problem with inventory. We have that kind of continuous management of data flow and interactions within a classroom using software. And then the ultimate outcome of this is this idea of, this was an experiment done at Dartmouth, where they built a, um, a cell phone app that used the, the, the regular kind of uh, functions on the smartphone, right? The smartphone has a microphone, the smartphone has a GPS, and the smartphone knows whether or not it's plugged in or turned on. So uh, they built a map of campus and they said basically, okay, if it's 2 p.m. and you are in a certain coffee shop or you're in the library and it's pretty quiet and you haven't touched your phone in 20 minutes, you're probably studying. If it is 2 a.m. and you are in a frat house and it's Thursday morning uh, and it is very loud, you're probably at a party. Um, and if you are in your own dorm room and it, the lights are turned off and your phone is plugged in, you're probably sleeping. And so by those simple interactions of basically socializing, studying, and sleeping, they could predict people's GPA within a letter grade by the, by the halfway through the term and 90% by the end of term. 
Um, and so the insights generated by this kind of background scanning, first of all, this is totally agnostic when it comes to uh, you know, learning tasks or learning outcomes or goals. Uh, it's, it's very you know, crude in that way, it's sort of, but it's also incredibly useful in the sense that it generates um, patterns that can also be turned into information for students if they want to use it in a Fitbit kind of inspirational way or in a generation of social proof type of way, like, oh, your friends are studying, you should be studying too. And the things they found, one, one pattern they found that was really interesting, obviously students who study more get better grades, that's not a big surprise, but what was really interesting was that for students who did better, there was a drop in socializing after the midterm. So they might have been, it doesn't matter if they were social butterflies the whole term or they, were butterf or they were homebodies the whole term, as long as they were able to curb what they had been doing earlier and focus and buckle down, then they had an improvement in grades. So that's the kind of information that says, okay, it's all right to go out and have fun with your friends as long as you know how to delay gratification when it counts. Um, and this kind of shows us the future of what Team Robot could do without a predefined rubric, without um, a bunch of multiple choice questions, but just with a full big data approach to generating low inference evidence about how students interact, right? Um, but there are some caveats here, right? We don't want to just be reducing students, again, to a certain set of scores, a set of numbers. Predictive analytics are no good unless they're predicting something that you can intervene on, right? It takes the, the teacher, it takes the advisor to be the minority report interrupter. Um, and you know, you're not just trying to flatten out, once again, the experience of education into a bunch of numbers. You need to use that to inform the human relationship and hopefully an authentic moving learning experience. Um, so that's Team Robot. Team Butterfly, you guys all know really, really well, right? Project-based, performance-based learning um, with a rubric, creative. This is a, a still from a video presentation from a um, performance-based assessment of science and technology at a school in Kentucky. Um, the, the, the student designed a, you know, um, a, an experiment with a control group to test whether he could calm his, his dog down and get the dog's heart rate down so the dog would eat better and have a better um, digestion. Um, worked out pretty well. Uh, and so, you know, I just wanted to point out how this segues into the real world. You know, there are websites now called like Behance where people can upload portfolios of uh, creative visual work. Um, that allow them to really bypass gatekeepers. If our students get really, really good at telling their own stories, um, that they can, uh, you know, that kind of assessment uh, is something that can take them past the gates and directly to employers, and it's going to be a necessary uh, skill for everybody to develop. Um, what do we do in the context of performance-based assessment? We, uh, we build up skills of empathy. We allow students to give each other feedback and to understand that everybody has different skills and different abilities. Um, the culture of the CRIT is a culture of support as well as bringing toughness to, uh, d you know, helping each other get better. Um, and performance-based assessment works really, really well when revision is always part of the process. And I think that's also true for the people who design a performance-based assessment, portfolio-based assessment system as equally well as the ones who are engaging in it. And the, you know, the caveats about the team butterfly kind of approach have to do with how comparable can you get those results. You might be really, really confident that your students are outperforming any students that you've seen in your school, but how well are they doing compared to students around the country? And that's really where we kind of break down as far as figuring out how to implement a fully holistic assessment process that is, you know, can be very, very subjective without easy, easy um, fodder for comp comparability and that's where online networks really, I think, can, can come in. Um, so social and emotional skills, we know that we have 21st century goals for our students. We want critical thinking, we want communication, we want empathy, um, we want grit, we want growth mindset. The, the, the tools that we're using today are somewhat primitive. We're using a lot of surveys, right? We're using the grit scale, um, Angela Duckworth's 12 item grit scale, which is incredibly predictive, but it doesn't necessarily give you fodder for um, you know, figuring out how to change. We don't know for a fact that just because someone's self-reports of grit go up that their outcomes are going to be better. This is um, another example of the, the Gallup student poll, which shows a relationship between um, you know, what you do in school and your chances of thriving in life. It also shows, you know, the indicators of grit, of, sorry, of zest, 
well-being, gratitude, and other um, happy things around students, around teachers in the school environment. Um, so I think this gives you, you know, good feedback for improvement of the school environment. It's not, you know, the, the team monkey types of assessments, the survey types of, of tools are not there yet in terms of um, providing information about how individual students need to do or what they need to do. And this is a paper that was published earlier this year by Angela Duckworth um, at Penn. Um, you know, on this topic of grit, she says, we're not ready to develop high stakes measures of students' grit, and that's because we're relying so much on self-assessment. And what actually happens, what's really kind of interesting, when you get into an environment that pushes you harder, your self-assessment drops. Right, so there was a study done, um, again, um, by Martin West at Harvard Graduate School of Education. He did the previous study about math, um, the math skills not being transferable, and he says that, um, you know, if you compare two schools that objectively, one group of schools is doing much better at developing students' grit. They are working harder, they are more challenged, they're talking about these issues more. Those students are going to assess themselves as being less gritty than students at schools that are not pushing those skills. Because all of a sudden they're thinking about it, they're self-critical about it, they're pushing to improve. And so um, you can't always rely on self-assessment as a uh, genuine indicator of what's going on in a process within a school. So Team Monkey tools, I think, remain really, really important at the district level. We're trying to get big picture correlation information. And we're, always, we're also trying to triangulate between the answers that students and teachers and parents give and other types of data like behavioral data, attendance data, even sick days. And those types of information that can kind of help us, you know, it's more data points, not, le not fewer in terms of understanding what's going on with social and emotional um, environment and, and ecosystem in our schools. Um, so what is Team Unicorn? What could Team Unicorn be? This idea that we want to be able to have an authentic assessment, like the best performance-based assessment, is so, you know, it's so tied to real-world skills and outcomes, um, but also within a data-rich environment which allows us to draw low-inference comparisons between um, students in different settings, different groups. So some people think we might be able to do this in the realm of video games, right? If I talk about this in my book, this is a, a screenshot from a game developed by Glassland, Glass Lab, which is a collaboration um, between Electronic Arts and um, Pearson ETS. It's, uh, it's a game that teaches you how to do debate, basically rhetoric, between, in the um, realm of having battling robots that argue with each other. And so figuring out how to assess really complex skills where in the background the game is gathering information about the learner as the learner plays the game. And then the, the game is presenting evidence about the learner and the learner's understanding of really complex, highly developed topics. Um, and so these kinds of assessments are really in their infancy. We're not really sure how they're going to work. Um, you know, one idea is that you have these custom purpose-built environments for every kind of 21st century skill and you kind of go into the game and play the game in order to demonstrate your prowess um, or you can learn and assess at the same time. Um, the other idea, you know, might be more about uh, like the, the Fitbit, right, that there's a background um, data gathering running during your authentic learning experiences and then you kind of look at the data, you look at what you're doing and you're not driving by looking at the dashboard but you're looking at the road and then you have dashboard feedback at the same time. Um, I'm interested in, 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 in examples of this of, you know, basically I see, what I see is that is districts and leaders like you, like yourselves, looking for ways to incorporate new types of evidence gathering into a constant process of iteration of A-B testing and of providing formative feedback to their students students. And so, um, you know, not endorsing but talking about new possibilities. This is a company called Panorama which um, provides this sort of survey-based data but also is sort of um, trying to market a, a platform wherein people can try different interventions, gather evidence for how they're succeeding and then um, push that in that um, their own information back into the process. And really, it's, re, you know, it's realigning the process of assessment with everything else that you do in your school without, instead of having a drop from the, the sky assessment, can you decide within your school what the things are that you would most like to have information about or you would most like to improve on and then gather data on those, on those points as well as satisfying other folks in the ecosystem. Um, I think, you know, um, Hapera, which is a Google app, uh, in, interacts with Google Apps for Education, is another way of sort of looking at um, providing a, 
a, a constant sort of in assessment environment, a place where there's always an opportunity to gather data, gather evidence without interrupting other school processes. And so, you know, a very, very simple way of, of, you know, a case study or example is to say, like, if you assign students to work on a project and they're using Google Docs, you can look at the edit history in Google Docs and get a really good idea of how, um, you know, who is participating in the project, who's not participating in the project. And grading for collaboration has always been so difficult to do in group projects. Now there's a record. Now there's a way of, of providing at least a basis for a conversation about what is your collaboration grade? What is your participation grade? Are you providing helpful feedback um, and commentary to other students in the, pro in the course of with either group or individual work? Um, so, you know, going back to this point of feedback being one of the mechanisms by which kids form mindset, I hope that some of the ideas, the four teams that I presented this morning, also give you the idea that you all have the power to use feedback and mechanisms of data, gather, data gathering to shape mindset, for both for yourselves as well as for everybody within your schools. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're going to do a little bit of back and forth with the students and hopefully have a bit of a conversation up here in collaboration with you. Um, maybe we'll pass this mic, because you don't have a hand held on the table, right? Pass this mic down there. So lots of interesting um, food for thought in her talks. We're really curious to, to hear what questions emerged.